Hey folks, welcome back to Truth Talk with Steve. Today I've got a guest that I'm just getting acquainted with, but I just really feel has got some great insights to some things that have take that are taking place and have taken place for I hate to say I believe decades and decades now uh, with the Mormon Church. So I want to welcome to the show today, Sharisa. Thanks for being here, Sharisa. How are you? I'm doing great. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Oh, you bet. You know, I I just it's only been about a week since I first run across one of your shows. And, you know, it, uh, you caught my attention because you had mentioned some things on one of my podcasts. And then I obviously went to dig in and try to find some of your videos. And I did and I found them very interesting and, and right along the lines with things that I have learned a lot about. In fact, the one case you, uh, person you mentioned you had been, been involved with, and we'll get into what that means here in a second, but it's a case in Utah County that's really, a big, big case that's been going on for over a decade now, an SRA case. And I think I mentioned to you, and I'll talk to you more about this later, um, the guy I met who literally lives right here, same town my office is in in Utah, uh, literally full time. That's all he does is dig in. And it's incredible what he and a, a guy that goes by Goel have dug up. And, you know, there's just no denying it. So, uh, we're talking about David Hamblin in that case. Um, you know, there's some very strange things. I've read all the police reports with the interviews, uh, with victim statements, and it's it's just that stuff's hard to even believe that people do that stuff. But it's to me, it's 100 percent obvious because I've just dug in and found so many things that this stuff. There is more Satanists in this world than we can imagine. I think so many more in the United States that. It's mind blowing. I don't think we have a clue. Oh, so, yeah. how, I mean, how did you grow up? Did you grow up? Did you were you born into a Mormon family? Oh yeah, thick pioneer heritage all oh, the way back too. to tanners, mm -hmm, pioneers, and polygamists. And um, I have family history books of polygamy that my dad printed out and shared with us, and seemed proud of. And wow. um, oh yeah, I mean, we're all the way back. My my family. Um, would brag about how one of our ancestors gave Joseph Smith money when he didn't have money. And he was promised um, because of this money that he gave him that his family would never starve. And it was interesting because one time when I was living in sin, when I was in college, my brother called me up and told me that, didn't you know that we were given this promise, you know, and because you're li like, I think he was having financial issues. And he was like trying to blame them on me because the yeah. promise was the as long as family. <laughs> You're not <right>. living right. <laughs> financially stable and, you know, oh, like, God. which is funny because they all had their whole little secrets. But I mean, as long as you live the cover story, that's what it's interesting about Mormonism is this covenant, the satanic Luciferian. Um, it actually works in the way that they want it to. And the the covenant of that you take in the temple is actually kind of fascinating. Did you go to the temple? You spent well, yeah. the time. And I went before the, I went the year they changed it. So it was still had the slitting of the throat and the, oh, yeah. the bowel yeah. dismemberment mm -hmm. thing. I mean, just wow. I mean, so crazy. Now that I can see what I can see that my eyes are open, that we as human beings go through that. And when you are in and you're hypnotized, the way it does, you don't even question things. And that is just crazy to me now, as I can see. And it's, you know, so I don't blame people that are still in because I, I was one of them, but it is so crazy. And it's so, to me, I guess the reason I do this is because if I could just plant a seed in somebody's mind that would hopefully get them to be willing to think and consider uh, I actually had someone reach out last week to me in a DM dog, you know, getting on me for some Facebook posts. And it was someone who my dad was in the high priest group with. Um, and, you know, <laughs> it's, it's sad because he made a specific comment about doubting your doubts. Right. And I remember when Dorf said that I was like, first of all, my take is no matter what the situation, he who has nothing to hide, hides nothing. What do you have to worry about? And so I responded back and I was, you know, I was kind of bugged, but I, I wanted to handle it right. But at the same time, I also didn't want to get involved because I know that negative energy would suck me down. And then I just said, let me ask you something. Would you doubt your doubts and ignore 
things if this was related to business or other parts of your life? The answer is simple, you know? And anyway, he responded back. What's that? Oh, go ahead. No, I say he responded back and just got all on me. And I was, frankly, I was pissed. And I spent like a half an hour writing the response. And I was like, what are you doing? And so I just deleted it, blocked him, and it was over. I'm not, you know, yeah. it's because you can't. And that's all, yeah, you can't, can't, you can't fight. Mm -hmm. exactly. there, there's a writer, a poet, musician, and she has a line in one of her songs. And she says, trying to wake up a deep sleeper is like trying to wake up a bear in winter. You know, like you're, yeah. you try to pull them out of their hibernation and you're going to get, you know, it's just, it, oh, and that's why I, I talk about what I talk about. And it's funny because yeah. I did this interview. I don't know if you've watched it yet, but it was with this guy named David or Norman. well, DJ um, Norman. Oh, yeah. And I, he, he saw all the way up. He saw the prophets and Bednar murder since he was a little kid. Oh, and yeah. um. <laughs> He, he got our interview. He's a great guy, uh, but he's still really programmed and he admits it. He knows he's oh, yeah. programmed and is, yeah. and is doing his programming. But he has no fear because he's also in this government program and, and he has some classified stuff going on. And so he's watched and protected on another level. Yep. And so he just, he just took our interview and sent it right straight to all the general authorities pages and tagged him on it. I'm like... That is I don't awesome. know. We want to be notifying the murderers, you know, <laughs> that we're outing them. I mean, I'm like, none of those people, none of those Mormons are even going to watch that. They just deleted right. it off of the page. Right. You know, they don't want anything to do with that. They're not ready for that until something really comes out publicly. But, you know, it's kind of a gradual thing you have to grow through. And when I was leaving the church, well, I want to go back to the temple, but when I was leaving the church, God told me really clearly, like, to do it carefully. I had these little inklings of these visions where he was like, I didn't know why he was, he showed me a vision of me hiding under the pew. And so I was staying in there for a while. And when I left, I was still in a Joseph Smith apologist and I didn't have any problems mm -hmm. with the church even into, you know, when I was going into shamanism and everything. Um, but when I really started going back after I got distanced enough from it and it wasn't going to be traumatizing for me anymore to have to, um, be mad at it, you know, right. um, I started realizing what was going on in the temple when I went back and started reading those scripts again. And the telltale sign of the covenant that Mormonism is Luciferian yep. um, is when Lucifer in the temple turns and looks at the whole audience and says, if these people in this audience this day don't live up to these covenants, then you will be under my power. Yeah. Okay. That's a covenant. And you make a covenant with Lucifer to be under his power. You're not if perfect. You don't live yeah. Which is antichrist. Yeah. Right. Totally. And then you wear the compass and the square on your garments. And those symbolize exactness. Yeah. Which completely delineates from mercy and grace. Antichrist undoes what was done on the cross. It's Luciferian. It's, it's that simple. That's like the most key place you can focus on to understand you and anybody that I've told that to who wasn't quite quite ready to look at some other things, it does something in your brain when you realize that's oh, literally what exactly. Happened. Yeah, I heard that yesterday when I was listening to that. But for those listening, I want to I want to read something that you know because when you said about murders, you know, if any if any members listen to this, they're going to think that's absolutely wacko. And I know it's not for sure. I mean, ninety nine point nine because unless I'm there myself, then I know for sure. But but we've talked about that on other episodes, and this is a message that I got from a total stranger. You know, I've also had uh, Madeline, the galactic storyteller. I don't know if you know Madeline, but, you know, she's worked with a lot of victims. I talked to her this morning for a minute, but she's worked with a lot of victims that have been, you know, victims through that SRA, the Satanic Ritual Abuse, and named names, you know, many victims, all there, you know, with the same people. And so I get this message on February 13th of this year. She says, I have to tell you that I appreciate your Rumble account so much. People need to wake up to what's going on. I have a close relative. I'm not sure she's ready to read. To, uh, she's read to the public yet. She's been threatened and she is terrified, but I will speak for her. She was trafficked her entire youth. She is now 50 in her 50s. Her father also trafficked her eight children. It is horrific. Her main handler was, and she put initials, GBH. Which is Gordon B. Hinckley, 
and TSM and BKP, Thomas Monson, Boyd K. Packer. She also was raped multiple times. I'm abbreviating those names, blah, blah, blah. She says, you know, but there's was many incidents in temples and such. It's disgusting. I'm heartbroken for them. Anyway, I mean, yeah, I got that. And then, I, like I said, I've got four or five totally different sources that aren't tied together. They're telling me the same thing. And, you know, in fact, I think it was uh, that Norman or whatever his name is on that show yesterday, you know, he validated again something I was told by two other people that when Monson's involved, he likes to do the smiley face when he does a sacrifice. I mean, yeah. it's, yeah, it's a, it's a hard pill to swallow folks, but it is absolutely. I mean, this is a satanic cult period. Yeah. All the way to the top. Every one of them. Yeah. I mean, and, and people, the thing is, is, you know, there was even I kind of thought this for a while. I thought, well, it was infiltrated and well, there's some people hiding in there. And when you talk to enough people and you've been researching this long enough and not just research, but like personal meetings, like in my medicine, indigenous communities and people that I met, um, like the Wiccan community that we're going to talk about with David Hamlin, like that community has that's where all the people end up going who have been abused by Freemason, state presidents, fathers, grandfathers, all that's in the family. They, they don't, they don't know how to heal through Jesus anymore. So they leave religion and they end up in the psychedelics community looking for healing. And all you meet there is just a whole bunch more Satanists. There's actually a whole branch of the Illuminati that's hidden within the Wiccan community and the Mormons are connected to them because what the Mormons are doing now is because it's been magic for so long. And I saw this happening with even my brother, um, people who are involved in these bloodlines, they're intentionally like letting them out of the church. They kind of act like they're leaving and they're, they're going out into the new age energy healing Wiccan communities. And <laughs> they're handling all of the people who are going out in those communities looking for healing that are going to talk about and trapping them again. So you have all these little flowers petals as you branch out and, and another cult and another cult and another cult and There's another so cult. Many that that. That. Yeah. So many podcasters that are all into that. So it makes you wonder, you know, we all obviously know that, you know, they're infiltrated everywhere, you know, and yeah. that's, that's the hard part is, you know, discerning who is real and who is not. And sometimes it takes a minute, you know, sometimes, I mean, these people are damn good at what they do, you yeah. know, they're, oh yeah, generations and generations of training. Yeah. And the one, the one cult leader that I came to while I was still in the Mormon church that kind of led me out of it, um, they were a polyamorous group. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's people deep in Mormonism who still go to the temple, who still are active, who are still getting callings, um, who are deep in polyandry, polygamy, polyamory. And that's one of... I mean, that was one of the first things that I realized was going on inside of the church. Um, and one of the women that was part of this group is related to Oaks through marriage. And her husband was like, clearly, I, I mean, you can see the signs. And the lady who was in the group that I was in, it was called Seven Elevations. Her name's Karen Prayer. She runs a whole place out of Salt Lake City. And she recruited me. Well, she spoke at a Zion conference and she's very connected to a lot of other Mormons in the Mormon church who are connected to this polyamorous practice on the side. And one of them that shocked me that I know she, you know, was in a relationship with was um, he's written all the books on the book of Isaiah. Now, uh, okay. have you ever heard of him? Uh -huh. Yeah, she had a side relationship with him before he married his second wife and um, you know, this group, they just, they just seem to be teaching deep doctrine because you go to church and you don't, you get milk. Right. And so you're, you're state, you're Mormon. And so the next big catch is like, who's teaching deeper doctrine within the church. That's not necessarily the general authority or anybody. And so that's what I was drawn to is those people. And so I went to a conference, um, called the Zion conference and it was put on by the guy who wrote the book, um, visions of glory, uh, he was going by Spencer, but his name is Tom Harrison. And I'm still on the fence about him. I don't know. I don't know if he's actually helping get rid of kids and knows what's going on in there. If he's, he's a part of it. Um, 
I hope he's not because he was my therapist for a while and I thought he was a really good guy. And he definitely has visionary stuff. He knew stuff about me that only God could have told him, you know. Yeah, talk about Do you know? Go ahead. Have Go ahead. you read that book, Visions uh, of Glory? You know, for some reason, if, when you said it, I felt like I could see the picture of it, the, the cover, but I'm not sure. I'm going to have to look when I get home. But yeah. Well, this was years from, ago when I was still in. What's, I mean, what is the premise behind the book? Because that'll tell me the if book, I'm well, he died three times. He, he was born I've dead and he I've, died. I've, yeah, he had a couple of I, near death experiences. So I read a ton of NDE has always intrigued me. So I read a yeah. ton of those books. And that's why I think, yeah. Okay. Yeah, my mom always got me into those books. And speaking of therapists, so, you know what's crazy is I told you about that guy that does a lot of digging. He sent me some stuff and one of the names, in fact, I think it might have been in the victim statements too but my mother's brother you know was a therapist BYU or you know I think he worked I don't know if he didn't work for BYU but I don't know if it, there was ties to BYU or not but um you know his office was right down there right by campus so maybe that's what I'm thinking about but regardless there's there's something there because his name was in there and and as when I saw that you know, I honestly thought, you now that kind of makes sense because of the way the family was, you know, the way he was. There's just something, you know, once you see a bunch of that and see, you know, when I'm, it's amazing how many people he's sent me information on with, you know, names of people and, and the neighborhood, the stuff, you know, is very prevalent in up in the Edgemont area. Um, I grew up in Oak Hills, which is just south of the temple, southeast of the temple, this other area where Hamblin's, you know, a lot of those people up above Tempe High School area, you know, I, I know a ton of those people. And there's some of these names he sent me that has been mind-blowing. In fact, Goel has, I think, put out on his Substack many of them, and some will blow people away because one of them was, uh, lives next door to my father-in-law and, uh, you know, was a, a counselor when my father was a bishop, and then he's became the bishop and you know, people just go to subs. Like, I don't want to say it on here necessarily because of my yeah, it lost ties, but it's a monster name that people will know throughout the world, you know, because of the industry they're in. But anyways, so let's get back to kind of like your family and then, you know, what happened is you got married and then, you know, how did you come across David Hamblin? Yeah. Well, so um, my marriage, well, let's see. I'm thinking if there's, I didn't, I didn't know anything in my childhood was off or odd. I, I just felt like I was a, in a really strict, typical um, Mormon family. You know, I had a lot of people around me who seemed like Jack Mormons compared to the way my family lived. And that was another sign of that Freemasonry going on because the, the perfectionism and the cover story, they legit, you have to live that. because That's what I've noticed is, is he sent me names and stuff. And then I brought him names because of, exactly what you're talking about those i call them those syrupy kind of mormons like but they're yeah. they're soft spoken and they just seem you know like they're the perfect mormon people and families and the ones you at least assume because of that are the exactly. most wicked. exactly that's it yeah. yeah so so then i ended up marrying um well i was inactive for a long time during college and dated a really well-known football player at Utah state for four years while I was up there. And I mean, my dad would like call my Bishop and Jeez. it was really stupid, but I, you know, I still paid tithing and stuff just because I did always see like this blessing of, it seemed like if I missed my tithing, I couldn't pay my bills, but that's one of the curses of Mormonism is you really get cut into a contract with the enemy. And if you don't pay into it, like he curses your finances. And so, you know, that's why I think it's really important for people to, I, I do want to mention, I have written this warfare handbook and like for the one that you're the woman you're talking about, who's afraid and hasn't come out yet yeah. and isn't ready to talk people like that, please send them to my handbook because okay. it will set people free. You have to do these renunciations. You have to be prepared um, out of that before you run, you know, like anybody who's telling me there's this guy on, Instagram and he's trying to get out of his family's cult. It's not Mormonism, something else. And he doesn't know how to get out of there. I'm like, 
he has a hard time believing in God, but I'm like, just read through this handbook because if you can break and renou renounce all of these cults and bloodlines and brotherhoods, um, then you cut that tie and that, that connection that your soul is linked in with, and then God can come in and protect you. Um, but because of the iniquity on the bloodline and literally the laws that God is bound by as well, um, you're not protected if you try to get out, which is how I ended up being arrested and put in the hospital and lost my kids. I had to learn how to take away the legal right and get rid of the legal right. Yeah. So um, anyway, so back to so tithing and college. And then I got married went later for a Mormon. And I ended up marrying my brother, one of my brother's best friends. And I didn't know until way later down the road that my marriage was actually arranged. And Jeez. that was just a Holy spirit thing <clears throat> that became really obvious. And then it made so much sense. And then I started hearing how common it is. And then like DJ David Norman that I interviewed, um, he talks a lot about how they arrange all these marriages and, and down to like, I was written into his patriarchal blessing, you know, and since all of that, um, since we got divorced and I've been able to look back and wake up and understand what was going on in my marriage, like he was not interested in me. He, he lives the cover life very well, but he's, he's power hungry. He's a sodomite. Clearly he was never interested in sexual relationship with me whatsoever. Um, and he was all about climbing the ladder at work, yeah. you know, and going through that and, um, and looking back, you know, he just, he literally was involved in, in college. We lived in New York for three years and I found out that the man who sponsored his scholarship at Columbia university, um, his name's Alexander Bodini. And I opened up the Facebook on Facebook one day, the black book that they had um, distributed of um, what's the pedophile name, the plane airplane and the Island. And oh, all that. Um, his, this guy who gave him his scholarship and then hired him for a year out of college was one of like the first five names on Epstein's wow. flight. And so, you know, I sent that to him after we were divorced and was like, Oh, look at this. Look whose name's on the, and he, he won't even respond. He just, yeah. he the best at his oath of secrecy. I mean, he won't budge, but I've confronted him on stuff yeah. and all he can do is roll up the window and look ahead and, and just be fuming in the car when I've called him out on everything. And he, he's made it so obvious that he's involved Jeez. in all of that down to, um, so hopping over to David Hamblin and how I got in and, and met him. Um, after I left Mormonism, um, I, and, and then after I got divorced because I, so this polyamorous group in the long run, they really presented this whole teaching to me. Uh, and this is something I haven't talked about. So let me go into this for a minute. Cause I really haven't gotten into this on any of my interviews. Um, yeah, this polyamorous group, Karen Prayer, she was like a female Joseph Smith. Well, and I, and I don't know if I should say that because now I've been hearing a lot of stuff that Joe Smith was, wasn't actually a polygamist. And I don't know if that's true or not, but we'll call, we'll call her a female Brigham Young. We yeah, know there you go. Sure. yeah, we know for sure he, he went yeah. off the rails. Uh-huh. And, and actually, David Norman, said, he, he says that, that Brigham Young was a Rothschild, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so, David Norman. I mean, what fascinated with me? I mean, I was fascinated by him, period. I taught him some time, but the way he knows gematria, because I've, you know, I've learned a lot of, I, I mean, I can't. I don't dig into it and use the, you know, the tools to, you know, follow certain meanings and all that. But there's no doubt that there's, I mean, yeah. it's fascinating yeah. when you really see what the numbers add up to, to so many things, whether it's the Bible or just in life, period. It's, it's yeah. incredible. And they do, you know, I'm, I was fascinated by how many things he referenced even to 9-11, because we know 9-11 is a big time number to, you know, yeah. the Illuminati, you know. Right. Yeah. So, um, so I, I ended up at this conference I was talking about where like all of these kind of big wigs in the prepper community, like deep meat doctrinal books that they've written community, they put on this big conference and I met Karen there 
And um, she had spoke and she had all of this knowledge and wisdom about the scriptures. And she gave a talk on wisdom and really got into how like, there's this whole feminine aspect that we don't touch on that's in the Bible and these patterns mm -hmm. of seven that are all over in the scriptures. And I mean, she was like a genius, you know, and I was just so drawn to her wisdom because I've always been a deep doctrinal, like I read the book of Mormon so many times, which I told, I was told was pretty rare for a woman. I was asked to speak in church a lot and, you know, the patriarch's wife would always tell me like, oh my gosh, that was like general authority type. <laughs> right. So, so, so I was, I was deep, I was deep Mormon and I just loved her her talk and so i went and i met her and i had written this energy healing method and th the thing at that time was all of the mormon moms in my area were all getting into energy healing and the church was speaking out against it but at the same time like it didn't make any sense because in the background there's this unspoken like magic that's going on and so many of these people were doing that in their secret lives anyways it was just a natural drift and so i was part of I ended up writing an energy healing method called spirit code. And it was a lot like another really popular method called emotion code written by Bradley Nielsen, who um, is just really famous across the world. He goes to Jerusalem and teaches stuff. It's about removing traps, trapped emotions. And I had like two miraculous healings through that method. And then I ended up writing my own method called spirit code, which was more of a circumvention of illumination of spiritual gifts that would then get rid of the darkness of the energy that would cause pain and other afflictions. He also wrote um, body code, which is used in a lot of chiropractors offices today. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I was affiliated with these groups and Karen Prayer did a lot of that stuff. She was trained in about anything and everything there is, which is a lot of these people who are Illuminati occultists fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they have got yeah. a million tools in their bucket, you know? So um, I started working on her team, selling her books, uh, you know, distributing her talks. Um, we would meet, you know, a few times a month. And I was, at, I was living in California. So I'd fly out and meet her and um, got another friend of mine involved here who her husband used to be a CFO for, uh, o U R, and so while we were friends here in California, her husband had a private jet, and he would fly us to Utah sometimes. And like Karen brought her sister wife out here to meet with us, and you know we were just all kind of gathering this whole group together. And I I had actually also offered for in in behalf of Karen at this big Zion conference. Um, I went and gave some of her healing CDs to uh, Tim Ballard really? and offered yeah. services to his team, his recovery team. Like this must be traumatizing. I'm sure you, you guys have PTSD from what you have to deal with. You know, we'd be happy to offer our services for free to you. And he could have cared less. Like I, I just had one interaction with him and I was like, Hmm. And yeah, so that's, that's, that's the next rabbit I want to dig into because I have a very sneaky suspicion and feeling and I'm, also, I don't know if you've ever listened to Lynn Packard's YouTube stuff, digging into oh, you are Tim. Yeah. Oh yeah, I, I met people personally. <laughs> information about him. It's funny because God's anointed my path my whole life to meet certain people to expose yeah. it down the road, and so I I just ended up meeting a lot of interesting main kind of screen people along the way. Um, and that spirit of discernment, when you look back, it was there the whole time, you know. Yeah. And so um, anyway, Karen led me into all of these teachings and I was in a miserable, you know, marriage that I, w I wasn't happy in because I was a yeah. person of mine yeah. who was not. And so okay. I was very sh much struggling in my relationship. And right. so, right. Um, but I loved him and I was an unconditional lover and I was very dedicated to my temple vows. And so mm -hmm. like, and, you know, everything that you're taught about when about Joseph Smith and Brigham Young in the early days of the church, when somebody takes you into DNC 132 and tells you the new and everlasting covenant means that you were, will everlastingly be given new covenant with, you know, more people in your life. That makes sense, <laughs> you know, and yeah. it, it's quite a fancy little um, ensnarement that they've set up there. That's very intentional. And. So 
I did have a belief in this new and everlasting covenant for about a year, you know, while I was hanging out with her team and seeing that they were living this covenant together. You know, she has had many other spiritual, she was doing spiritual husbandry and, but, but what she taught was that um, the reason that Joseph messed it up so bad was because he didn't include the women and it wasn't ever supposed to be just one sided because God's not a respecter of person. So why would he give that to men and not to the women? And that's why everybody was so miserable. So the women were supposed to have it too. And and so that was how she always talked about, well, this is how you build Zion. You have to be equally both sides. And then, you know, and then the other thing that it started leading into was um, that God will ask you to lie. And she had many places in scripture where God literally like gave people, gave people permission to, you know, tell a fib. And so that just because your spouse isn't ready to ascend into that space doesn't mean that you should be held back. And so, you know, she had my mind all wrapped up in this web of spiritual husbandry and and polygamy and polyamory and that it was a spiritual law you know and it made sense because my husband didn't want nothing to do with spiritual right. growth he was on his phone looking at numbers at work every week at church you know and so um that landed me eventually i i actually ended up leaving their group because i was actually having visions that they were um doing a lot of stuff that I didn't understand because the visions were symbolic, but she knew because she's a visionary too. And her sister wife was the main one who really taught me. She's they're smart people. They have a lot of really great spiritual, these Luciferians, you know, Um, they just use them for the wrong purpose, but they, they're the ones who taught me um, and helped me grow my gift of dream interpretation but they were twisting everything to favor they were everybody who'd come to them with a dream they would twist it to favor their teachings yeah and so i started figuring just a lot of this stuff out that was going on with them and had called them out on some stuff and she literally had the whole group come together and like they kicked me out um and it was kind of funny because she said to she's a powerful woman and she said you are a very powerful woman and she said and I'm afraid that you have the ability to tear down everything that I've been developing for seven years, you know? Oh. And so anyway, it was kind of funny looking back on how the whole thing played out. But um, two of the people that were in that group with her, I stayed friends with. And it was weird because she hated me. And I think she felt like because it was a sex cult, like she felt threatened by me because I was younger than her and a little more hip to like, I mean, she was in her fifties. And so her main other husband guy, like he and I were just good friends, you know, and I think there was obviously jealousy, but that was her main teaching is we have to rid Zion of jealousy, envy, and strife. Right. So I used to sit back and, go, and you're the worst one. <laughs> so why she, she claimed God gave her the keys to, um, wow. you know, this polyamory in, in the new Zion that he was building up. Was her, was so, her, was her last name Crit or Greer? Prayer, P R I R, prayer. Yeah, prayer. yeah. Right. <laughs> her husband actually owns this building in Salt Lake City, and he's like a violin maker or something. They have this whole studio that where she teaches her classes. And I, I looked back and started realizing they would seen these things where she would get caught with her first husband, her like her the second guy that she was her spouse next to her immediate family that she lived in her home with. And um, his wife didn't know, but they would go on trips and stuff together just as a group for doing God's work or whatever. She got caught in a sexual compromised position with him and her husband caught them. But he uh, he knew the whole thing because then he was just like fine with it. And and then what they were trying to set up is that, oh, see, your husband will accept and receive when he finds out what you're doing for God. You know, Um, all it was is just a twisted way to get somebody wrapped up into an affair. But. Um, but it was interesting because God used her to get me out of my marriage. And because I had a lot of guilt about this for years about what ended up happening. But, um, you know, God had to come in and soothe me with a lot of mercy and grace. Um, when I started repenting after I got out of new age and got out of indigenous polyamorous mindset, um, through 
helping me understand that my husband was a sodomite from the day we married, you know, and he was never committed in my marriage. And so, and he would have never let me out had it not been for his ego that flared up when I cheated on him. And so it wasn't through her group that this ended up happening, but there was another guy that another friend of mine, and there's a whole group of these people within the energy healing community who were also Mormons who were still teetering, you know, in both worlds and who knew about people living these practices. And so this guy came into town from another state. I can't remember where he lived, but he, he had written a book about like faith that can produce miracles or something like that. And okay, well, his name is Brent um, Satterfield. And he actually was a scientist that developed the um, PCR test for Utah during the whole. Yeah. Yeah, So these people are deep and thick and I look back and I honestly think the entire thing was set up by my family. The whole, I think every one of them was player in handling my life down to him. But so he, sh- he ended up calling me one day because there was all of uh, these people of us who had met Karen and knew that she was teaching this principle. And he had done a whole group of his own where he'd had like seven wives at one point, his wife was totally in on it and she wouldn't take another husband. He tried to get her to, but she wouldn't do it. So <clears throat> he ended up reaching out to me and he had just come back from India And so he was like this guru, you know, he had these gifts and abilities and he carried an energy and a vibration with him that was palpable. Like he came and walked in my sister's house and I felt felt like, yeah, it was crazy. And he gave me this little token that this temple that he had been at in India, um, he said that the monks or whoever it is that whatever they call them that were in this temple where he had been living for the past couple months that they out of nothing give birth to this little thing in their mouth. They have this ability where they like do this magic and they give birth and create this thing. And, and he's like literally several times a day, like they manifest these things out of nothing in their mouth. And it, it looks almost like a little thing that felt falls off of a tree or something. I, I had it for a long time. I'm sure God made sure I lost that, but, um, but he just had this power, you know, that was tantalizing So it's funny because this whole experience really took me to like the story we're told about Joseph Smith, whether it was him or not, or Brigham Young, whoever it was that was, you know, tricking people into doing, living this lifestyle. Like I understand it. And that's why God allowed me to have this experience because I needed to understand how absolutely tantalizing and um, inviting and spiritual and wicked all of it is, you know, at the end of the day. So, um, so yeah, I ended up, cheating on my husband and got divorced and he was so enraged. He kicked me out of the house and um, told me I need to go to Utah and stay with my family. Cause I didn't really have like close friends. I never really made close friends in Mormonism. They were really formal, weird relationships with anybody yeah. in the church. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so I didn't have anybody that I felt like I could go stay with me. And, and he was just like, you need to get out of here and go stay with your family. And my daughter was only five at the time. And so I was like, okay, so I, it was really interesting because that day I actually went into deep prayer and got in the shower and was like praying and the Holy spirit literally said to me, leave and take no purse or script. And so I was, cause that morning he was really when it was like the third day after he'd found out what happened and he went and read all my journals. I'd been having visions and stuff for months. And the thing that's interesting is while I was carrying this belief, like God allowed me to have this lambs will placed over my eyes to like think that polyamory was like some spiritual higher law. Um, Mm -hmm. He was also giving me all of these visions and showing me that Karen was like a mess and corrupt. And like, I I could go back and he, he sent me there for a reason really to expose it at some point. And so um, I, he, he kicked me out and I, went back to Utah, but my kids were going to this little Jewish summer program. And I went down to the school and asked my youngest daughter if she wanted to go with me and told my kids that we were getting divorced because we hadn't said anything to them yet. And, um, she said, yeah, that she wanted to go with me because she was only five at the time and he was never home. And so I took her with me, but I didn't take anything and I didn't even take any money. And, um, 
I, I had, well, we had a whole bunch of ones because we're in, in like our food storage emergency supplies or whatever. So I took a bunch of stacks of ones and like, I took like a bathing suit and a change of clothes for my daughter, but that was it. And he left, he left to go to lunch and I just left to, to go to Utah. And, um, even though he told me to go, you know, I didn't want him to know that I was going to take my daughter because I knew he wouldn't let me. He'd already told me, threatened me several times. You are crazy. Because I ended up telling him everything Karen had taught me. He knew I was working with Karen. And he, when he found out that I had cheated on him, he told me he had a dream like two weeks before that I had cheated on him. But I just think that my family was telling him. And I honestly think he was trying to get out of the marriage for a long time because when you're a Mormon sodomite Freemason who has to live a secret lifestyle, like you don't want to be married to an expendable. Yeah. Like, I mean, I actually loved God and he doesn't. So he, he didn't want that. So, um, I think he was trying, trying to get me, everything is staged so that it looks like you chose it. You did it. You created this. And so I left with my daughter and he ended up going and getting ex parte orders and his brother showed up at my brother's house. And I know my brother let him in cause there's no way he just walked in the house while I ran down to target for a minute and literally went in and like took my daughter sleeping out of the room at, with orders and took her back to his house and gave him to my husband and he took her back to California. And so then his mom came and lived with, um, them for like three months while he kicked me out of the house. And I literally was like just floating around staying at random people's houses. And it was horrific. And so, um, that was the first time he accused me of kidnapping my own kids because he kicked me out of the house and he thought what that I'm going to leave my five-year-old home with you while you go to work all day. Like his, his right. brain and his thinking is just so like such a Mason, you know, just con- pure control. And so, <clears throat> um, after all of that played out, I, I, yeah, I needed healing. And so I started going further and further into like the energy healing community and then into like the, the indigenous, you know, community right. that was, right more like these rainbow children that were sitting in these indigenous style ceremonies and um, a girl that had taken my energy healing class um, told me about ayahuasca. And so she invited me to a ceremony and um, actually, no, that's not what happened. It was when I was still living in California, just, I'm trying to think when, I think it was when I was still married, I, I, I had quit wearing my garments while I was still married and started just being interested in other spiritual paths. I was still mm-hmm. going to church, but I was really looking at a lot of other stuff. And so I got invited. It was my 20 year anniversary and I got invited to go to this guy's party who I didn't even really know in high school, but he had reached out to me on Facebook and said, Oh, I see you live in California. You're only an hour from me. Like I have hella friends who are all healers and stuff. You'll love them all. Like you should come to this party I'm having at my house. I have this big, huge mansion. I'm selling it next month. And so I'm having a big old, like going away party. I'm moving into a van. And so he invited me to come out. And that was where I met like this community within California of healers, but they were really all just like psychedelic junkies. And, um, I shouldn't call them junkies because really it, the psychedelics community is incredibly different than a junkie community. I mean, everybody's looking to raise their vibration, heal some trauma. Um, you know, these people aren't like using drugs for any reason, except for to go into like an indigenous ceremonial spiritual setting to receive healing. And so I was invited. He connected me with some people there that ended up inviting me to a ceremony and it was interesting because, you know, it's just that it can be such a long story. So the end of this story is what really matters that the first ceremony I went to was three days long. And um, I found out down the road that they were liter- literally trying to kill me through witchcraft at this ceremony. And the next ceremony I went to in Utah, my ex-husband, we met halfway um, in Southern Utah from where I lived in Davis County to him coming and I was going to go to a ceremony there. And he knew, he said to me, he's like, are you going to do that ayahuasca? And I was like, I don't talk to anybody, you know, besides my closest friends, somebody's obviously like feeding him information, you know, and especially something like that, like who would have told him that like only somebody who really wants to betray me. 
but he also wanted me to know that I couldn't do anything without him knowing yeah. he knew everything that I did. Um, even though I, he, he forced me to move back to Utah with the kids when I eventually got them back and we tried to fix things for about two weeks. And then that was when I found out that he was, um, well, that's not when I found out he admitted he didn't think his dad was his real dad. And then a year later he got a DNA test after we were divorced and found out he's half Iranian. And mm -hmm. I think he was right for that. Um, mm -hmm. cause I don't believe his mom's story for one second, but she met some dude in the bar, had sex with him five times, didn't want to tell him about the baby and that my husband was just a product of this relationship because she was separated from her husband at, t at the time. And it never really made sense that she was going to get divorced while she was six months pregnant. So her stories just never yeah. lined up. But so he, I, you know, we find out he's half Iranian and he knows all this stuff about me and just more and more things start getting weird and suspicious. And so, um, but I still was, you know, going to these ceremonies and I um, was introduced to this guy named Dylan Kidder and he is in the, that community across Arizona, Nevada, over to, he's from Michigan, which is where a lot of the witches come out of. Um, there's a lot of Satanists and witches communities out of Michigan. And he was all over. He was like a traveler. He didn't have a low, wow. he didn't have a home. He would loaf on people's couches and always be looking for donations, but he was serving combo. And his story was he was just so dedicated to the medicine and helping people heal. So combo was where I met David Hamblin. And um, so, you know, I'm looking for healing from this traumatic divorce and, and whatever happened and just trying to make sense of my life and not really even knowing or fully understanding why, like I felt like I needed so much healing. And so um, the first place that I met Dylan was at a cabin that was, um, what's, what's the general authority Hales who's passed away. Robert D. Hales. Robert. Mm -hmm. So it was his son's cabin that he had inherited from his father when he passed. And I think he had only passed a short time before we went to the ceremony. So it was really weird because, you know, fast forward what I know now, a whole bunch of secret Satanist Wiccan, like indigenous healing earth medicine shamans are at hell's cabin having a medicine ceremony. Wow. It was just, it's just really weird what's going on there. Right. So this just goes to show all, all of them are connected. Oh, behind them. And so, um, I go up to do combo and co combo is a frog poison. They go out, it's a, it's, there's a jungle frog and they collect the, poison off of the skin of the frog and put it on a stick and it dries and cures and they spray it and reconstitute it. They burn you with a little um, incense and scrape it off and put it on there. And, you know, you'll have these like four little balls of frog poison on your skin <clears throat> and the burn opens it up. So it goes right into your skin. And for me, within 30 seconds to a minute, every time I was puking my guts out. Oh, you fast for 24 hours, then you drink a whole bunch of water. And what they say that it does is it gathers up all of your um, trauma and that you, it goes Stop. and puts it into the gut and then you spew it out, you know, yeah. one way or the other. And it's a pretty traumatizing medicine. Um, I, I did have some pretty miraculous healings with that stuff. I mean, it's legit, but it's also from a frog, <laughs> at, which is a reptile. <laughs> yeah, no, so that, that's the medicine of the reptilian um, breed, or seed. This the seed of the reptile, you know, that's right. their medicine. And so um, David Hamblin was there and uh, he was a pretty quiet guy for the most part. He's huge, literally massive, like, just a massive guy. And his sister was there also. And I'm trying to remember her name. Um, I think the guy in your video that you interviewed mentioned her name, Goel. Yeah, Goel. Um, I think her last name's Christensen. Um, and I talked to her a lot. I remember having a long conversation with her outside because I asked her if, if she, they, they are indigenous because her and David have a very 
indigenous bone structure in their face. Like they look like they could be like a Cherokee Indian. They have white hair, but mm. they're both like very tanned. And then they have like really broad cheekbones and jaw bones. And, you know, here I am at this indigenous ceremony and everybody's wearing like indigenous garb. And, and I'm like, I just felt like they were Indian, you know? And I think, I think they really liked that people thought that. So I had these conversations with her you know, outside for a good hour about her family and their, um, their ancestry and where they were from. And I don't remember a lot of those details, but I, I just remember what stood out to me was that, um, Goel mentioned to you that she would move everywhere he would go. Like they would try, were like a traveling group and she yeah, was there at the ceremony. Really she wasn't even receiving medicine. I don't think she, she might have, but I, I don't think she was, doing medicine that weekend they were just like hanging out up there you know yeah and so the one thing I and so then I ended up being around that group several times um it was always a sleepover too because you usually do two or three nights and you would stay the night and so he slept right next to me several nights in the same room and um it's just interesting what happened there but before I move on to what happened down the road with him I was um when I first met Dylan Kidder, who was, they were the ones that were friends that was, he was, you know, always receiving the medicine from, and he, Dylan seemed to be like the one who was training and giving more people like, cause so David served, um, peyote. And yeah. I didn't know that at the time it, it took a year or so before I found out that was, but, but, Dylan had a huge access to a huge medicine community. And so he would refer people into David Hamblin's um, ceremonies. And so I was um, at this, at this group and this Dylan guy, just to show you that this Mormon brainwashing and, and programming bleeds into so many other communities Um I was out in my car and Dylan walked out to me and he looked at me and he was like, I know you. And he's like looking deep into my soul, you know? Yeah. And I was like, really? I, that's interesting. He's like, we've met before. And it's like, you know, before now, like pre-existence, like you're my long lost sister kind of thing, yeah. you know? So, yeah, I mean, so. yeah. And that's They pull you in deep from the beginning. Like you're part of my family. So you're going to keep coming and paying me to do medicine for you because I need to make this money. And it became really clear to me really fast that Dylan's interest in this was all financial. Like he didn't care that much about helping anybody heal. If anything, he caused more trauma to everyone. Right. And another thing he said to me at another ceremony at another point was Dylan came up to me and pulled me aside and told me that one time before he went into one of his ayahuasca ceremonies that he was so afraid to drink the cup that he almost didn't do it. And so he just knew something really big was going to happen that night. And then he told me that he saw that night in ceremony, father and mother, father and mother, like the heavenly father and mother came to him and gave him these rights of this medicine, you know, and passed him these keys and initiations into healing people with this indigenous medicine. And so that was a very like Joseph Smith kind of experience. I just feel like this whole thing that I went through was like a recreation of the whole tale of Joseph Smith, you know, brought before my very yeah. face. Like I experienced it on some level in some way in real time. And so that's how telling these people are. I know now, like he's, he's a sorcerer and he's a Satan. Oh, yeah. and I'm sure that he knew that um, David was as well because they worked together a lot. And so he was the one who ended up really inviting me, like Dylan would call me and invite me to stuff and act like we were best friends. And I actually Jeez. had like, admittedly, this really big crush on him for a long time. And I think he does that on purpose. They pull you in, you know, oh, yeah. in this way. He had a girlfriend, but it was on and off. And so whenever it was off, I would always be like, maybe I have a chance, <laughs> which is just so weird because he was a jerk, you know, like looking back. But I was trained to like jerks growing up in Mormonism. So um, David um, would get like 20 dots of combo and not even puke. I mean, 
Jeez. looking back, if you understand this medicine, it was just one of those signs to me of how enmeshed he was with the demonic, you know, to have had stuff going on like that. And there was this one ceremony where he took, you know, like 25 dots of combo and he, it, he just passed out and timbered straight back, like smack, like Jeez. massive. Fruit. And, um, you know, and everybody's like, congratulations. Like that, that's like a, I mean, luckily nothing happened to him, but Dylan ended up going and catching him, but, um, just enough that he didn't hurt himself. But that's like a congratulations because you have, they call it a full rebirth because you didn't puke and you just pass. You, you, they say basically your soul kind of leaves your body and then comes back in and it's a full reset. And so it's a, it's a really good rebirth, wow. you know, <laughs> you get a golden star. Um, yeah. So my conversations with David, though, he admitted to me that he had been a therapist and that he was um, using sex to heal his clients. Now, I knew that he had a private office and I didn't know the details of it. I knew he, he, he very much admitted that he lost his license, you know, and everything. But yeah. um, the thing is, is to me at the time and the community that we're in, within the, this indigenous community and after having come out of a polyamorous Mormon cult, then you move into the indigenous community and polyamory is rampant in, you know, these groups. And so, and, and everything is all about sexual healing. It's very much a thing that's taught is that sex is healing. It's a form of healing. And, um, you know, monogamy or sex before marriage in these groups is no more even discussed. It's not a belief. Right. There. And so, I thought that he was completely out of Mormonism, you know, and that he had just moved into this healing path. He would talk about how he had a lot of trauma in his own childhood. He wouldn't go into detail, but that, you know, he was working on healing all of that stuff. And, but that, you know, it was rough because he had lost his mainstream business. And so now he was going and helping people to train through indigenous medicine, which honestly made a lot of sense to me at the time. I knew he'd lost his license for sexual healing. He didn't tell me, it was with boys or nice. that, that any details of it. Um, and I didn't know to what extent it was, but I just figured it was like a lot of people in these little groups that end up developing a relationship with somebody who they're thing because, because within these communities also, you know, you don't want to go to a professional because a lot of these people are victims of MK ultra or mm -hmm. um, church. And so they've been, handled their whole life. And so you're looking for a healer who's not a professional because you know, they're just going to reprogram you. And so it makes more sense to have a friendship with the person that is healing you. And it's more like a family. And so when you come into these family groups, then receiving healing from somebody, it's not that weird to end up in a relationship with them at some point, you know? Gotcha. Um, so I didn't think it was like a crazy thing at the time. And it, it, it was crazy too, because I hadn't even thought about that guy in three or four years since I had been away from all of them until um, this guy named Sam, who is a journalist in Utah, who actually mm. moved out there to cover all the SRA stuff. He ended up reaching out to me after he saw one of my interviews. And so he had sent me an article about David Hamblin, but I didn't recognize him at the time or really pay much attention to it. And then he sent it to me again a second time after he had told me he wanted to share some witness testimonies of his daughters and some abuse that had happened. And I opened it up and I was like, wait a minute. I hadn't looked at his picture and I just thought, I know the name David Hamblin. Who is that? And then all of a sudden it hit me. Oh, is that big, huge dude with the white hair and all the ceremonies? I mean, he has a long white braid. He, he looks like a big white haired yeah. Indian. Um, and so when I went and read through his daughter's testimonies that are like 50 something pages long and what they went through in their childhood with him. Real. I, I was just like, Oh my gosh, I cannot believe that I laid by that guy. Yeah. So many times. And Dylan ended up talking me into coming to a peyote ceremony that he was serving at. I'd never done peyote. And, um, I ended up, I was still in contact with, Karen Prears, uh, second husband and her sister wife. Um, and you know, they had remained friendly with me and they, they were, whatever was going on there, they were much more tolerable to have a relationship. She was just really, 
I did not like her in the long run. I always had issues with her and I pray and repent about it all the time. But in the long run, I saw why she was a serpent. And so, but I stayed close with those two because I felt bad for them because I could see that like she literally had a spell over them. Like they were even being so deceived by her down to the point that Ryan, who came to the ceremony with me, her other husband, he had this like big, huge golf ball size mass on his hand for a long time. And this night in ceremony, I told him, I looked at his hand and I said that, I mean, I, even though I'm totally a follower of Jesus, I still know that a lot of stuff in the, in these healing communities that they know and talk about, they're true. And mm-hmm. there are certain things that end up in your body a certain way for a certain reason. You know, there's signs that have afflictions in the body, bear a testimony or a witness of something. And he had this big, huge golf Saul's size infection going on in his hand and he'd done everything under the sun for that thing and couldn't get get it to heal or go away uh-huh. and i was sitting there and i just holy spirit told me i said that is karen's hand holding your hand that's the power that you give her that's when, when you walk away from her and you take your power back from her that that will heal and go away wow. and um so so this is who i went to the ceremony with was these two people and myself and um it was very interesting because it was different than any other ceremony. I didn't really have an experience, um, a a psychedelic or a healing experience in the spirit realm. It was very flat. I, um, and, but I mean, he's the one who ran the whole thing. He was doing the music. He brought the, and I did, I didn't enjoy it. I have to say there was a lot of other ceremonies that I went to where not peyote, just indigenous type stuff, but, the, it, it, for me, it was all about the music and they always provide, you know, um, sound ceremony and mm-hmm. beautiful songs and everything. And the music he provided bothered me. And so, you know, looking back again, these were some things going on and, and I did, I didn't have a spiritual experience and I know that it was because God was protecting me again, because these people are praying on you and they know how to, astral surf the spiritual realm and come into your space and do things that you don't even understand the witchcraft that you're under when you go to these indigenous ceremonies i had no clue um but looking back god showed me a big fat sign because the only thing that i saw that night was i had one vision and it was a big huge massive anaconda in the back of my van that was parked outside of the tent we were in wow and and God just showed me, this is just a big fat snake, you know, at, um, this whole thing. And that's who these people are, you know, that you're um, laying this medicine with. And I was just like, wow. And I, I know now too, that many of these ceremonies, even down to the one who was going to train me into, she was just through combo and other things. And she was going to train me into what she had been trained in, in India. Um, she accepted me as a stu- as a student, but it ne- nothing ever manifested out of that, and that was God's will. But um, I clearly, the Holy Spirit revelations through everything that happened, m- things my husband knew, the way I found out my family knew things about these people that I found and was connected to at these ceremonies, which would not seem like my little Molly Mormon family yeah. should have anything to do with any of these indigenous healers out in the desert who are totally little hippie people like yeah most mormons wouldn't even know of that stuff even existing honestly your typical real mormon family yeah and they knew they knew they knew these people and so um what what happened was after i cheated on my husband um he started trying to have me killed like what, what they do is, and, and Landmark, Landmark has been successful in this. They're their own little weird cult. But um, the, what the witches try to do, because it's not like they can just grab Porter, Porter Rockwell these days and have you off, you know, so they right. have had to be creative. And so they try to use witchcraft. And if they can get you out of your body through a psychedelics experience and get you out in the astral, then they can cut your cord. But it's really interesting because God knew this was all going to happen. And I've never been able to leave my body in any meditation I ever tried to do when I was 
going and experiencing these things, um, I, I, I and my spirits tuck very tightly into this physical body for a reason. And, but they, the trauma that I would go through, I would shake and tremor like crazy. And people in the ceremonies was, would always comment about how crazy it was to witness my experiences because literally they would bring me to the verge of death every single time I was there. But that's what they say you're supposed to do in this medicine. It's a rebirth. You know, you teeter on the edge of death so that you can be reborn and you're learning all these things and nobody ever really dies, you know, but like I had another friend who recently reached out to me that I hadn't talked to in years and he confirmed it again because he did. He, he was dead. He was flatlined in ceremony. There was three, um, they call them guardians who are there like to watch over everybody to make sure that they're in a safe meditation space. And they let him completely go and nobody did anything. And when he came to and didn't end up dying and he freaked out on him and like, they were all just pointing fingers at each other and, um, you know, just kind of brushing under the rug. And, but I mean, this place, it's just full of witches. And so that's why he, he ended up veering into this path because in the Mormon community, he couldn't do it anymore. Right. Like, and that's what happens when you get outed in one group, then they just send you into yeah. another group. And so now you can be out here and still do your Satanist stuff. And uh, I mean, well, and then at that ceremony as well, he had his little right hand guy. His name is Eldon. Um, is he the one that they talk about? Have you heard about his buddy that I, I listened to an interview by his wife? And I think it's the same guy. Um, is it Mooney? Uh, he, makes he makes knives. He makes knives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he was he always helped um, be a guardian of the ceremonies. Well, it, David made it really clear in the way he talked around what, what this guy was going through in the ceremony that night, because that guy was, he was huge too. And he was just, you can tell when somebody's being like spiritually tormented during these ceremonies. And he was just shaking and tremoring and yelling and having these wild things going on. And so David kept just telling everybody like, ah, oh, yeah, he had a really rough childhood. We're just going to let him do his thing. He was supposed to be there helping, but he was yeah. out the whole night, you know? And it's like, well, okay, that's why. Cause these guys are Satanists, you know, and they're just having a whole other satanic <laughs> experience in this indigenous medicine that, you know, or originally was intended to be a, a spiritual experience, but they're just right. using it for all the wrong reasons. And Anyway, he's, I just can't believe the stuff that his daughters went through. And the one thing that I remembered that was a second witness was after I left that ceremony, um, the peyote one that night, and I was driving home, I got pulled over. And I've just always had this thing with God. He, certain things are just mean something to me. And if I ever get pulled over, which is really rare, I know, like, that's God's way of telling me I'm doing something wrong. Like, and what is the message? And I don't even think I was speeding. Maybe if, if I was, it was barely. Um, but I just remember thinking, why did I get pulled over? Because during this time, I really believed that this was God's path for me because I didn't uh, know there was anything like indigenous medicine. Like it's from God. It's a plant, you know, right. um, the Indians did it. And I hadn't come to the realization that the serpent can go into the wilderness too and find people that live off of the land, you know? And, um, so I, I had this totally false idea of, you know, and it's biblical in the Bible. It does say, um, I prayed for years for God to tell me like, if, if plant medicine is in the Bible, if you're against it, show me where it's at. Cause you would have had to put it in there, you know? Right. And finally I found it and it's called rudiments. It's where he talks about the rudiments or in other translations, it's called elemental spirits, it's the elementals, the spirits of the elements, you know, Mary Jane, that's marijuana. That's yep. the elemental spirit of the plant. Um, a ayahuasca, they call the spirit of that um, grandmother and the frog. That's the spirit of the frog. And then, mushrooms they called that the los niños the children because it's like this little gnome medicine and people get more playful sometimes on that um and so even though 
you know, there's these plants, like they do take you into another dimension and then you are um, at the risk of being influenced and demonically oppressed because it's not like it's taking you to heaven. There's many other dimensions in the spirit realm. And so it's, it, it's an illegal access to the spirit realm. Right. Do you believe that there's, so do you believe that using any type of that stuff is, you know, negative or do you think there is a purpose at all? Well, this is where it gets tricky. Absolutely. There's a purpose because I've had, I know a lot of, you know, I've, I know several guys and I've listened to a lot of podcasts, you know, they don't go do it consistently. They've done it once or twice, a lot of veterans and it's literally changed their lives, you know? Yeah. So even it's, a lot of addicts, you know, they use a lot for addiction. Yeah. And I, I don't judge it. Um, I, I don't judge it because I did have good experiences, but when I look back and realized who I was with that traumatized me, and then I realized that they were traumatizing experiences, but I didn't know because of the grace of God. Um, but the thing, what, you know, when you get into it legally speaking in the courts of heaven and God and the law, um, this is how I see it because there is verses in the Bible that say, you know, just because your brother needs to eat herbs, you shouldn't judge your brother because he needs herbs because he ha has a lack of faith. Okay. That's one verse that I go, okay, I am that brother who needed herbs because yeah. I had a lack of faith. I'm like, I don't know. I, well, this world's pretty messed up. I don't know how to have that much faith. I'm a, pretty faithful person. I have a lot of freaking faith, you know, but, um, the issue is, is what, what, how I see it is that even there, I had a very spiritual experience where God led me to cannabis legally in California when I was living here, when I was married, smoked with my husband. Um, and it, that also revealed some of who he was to me because when you're programmed to the degree that he is like, you cannot use that stuff because it breaks down programming as yeah. well. Um, but the thing is, you don't, you don't need it, but a lot of people aren't ready to enter into a healing relationship with Jesus Christ that is perfect, that can take care of all that stuff through grace that's way better. And for me, I knew that I was supposed to go down that path. And looking back, even though I've had to repent of a lot of that idol worship, um, I was still supposed to go down to that path because I was supposed to meet a lot of these people. I was supposed to come out with a testimony and I see it more of like climbing a ladder, like Jacob's ladder, you know, um, mm -hmm. there is room and grace for it. I believe when you're in a stage of innocence and you don't know better, like for me, I, it took me a really long time to find it in the Bible. And I would have given it up sooner if I would have known that, you know, it says in the Bible, when it talks about elemental spirits, it says, taste not, touch not. Gotcha. When you're complete in Jesus Christ, and I can find those scriptures. I can't remember where they're at right now. But when you're um, complete in Jesus Christ, taste not, touch not. You know, it's essentially what it says. Yeah. And yeah. so then, you know, but then last week I got this random um private dm from this girl and it wasn't even on my public attorney at yaw page where i talk about all this stuff it was on my private page and i don't even know how she knew I knew anything about whatever but she just started private messaging me and telling me that she wanted to talk to me because she had had an experience and um <laughs> so she she's 18 years old she's a lesbian and she was born to two moms. Um, her mom got a sperm donor and her mom's a lesbian. And she's an atheist. And she went and um, had, she's from another country. I don't even know, remember like what language she speaks, but she calls them pados or something. And I was, I was like, I had to look that up. Mushrooms. Okay. So and I, she wouldn't have known that I had any experience with any right. of that. I don't even know. God just sent her to me, you know? Wow. And so she was like, I am embarrassed to say this, but I, you know, this is who I am. I had these paddles. And then like all of a sudden Jesus came and held my hand. And I felt just all of this love flow over me. And she's an atheist. And, um, he took my hand and held my hand and he told me you're important 
And then he said, she said she just felt him holding bean with her, you know, for a while. And then he said, you can do it. And then he left. And that's beautiful. You know, like how, so he's going to use it. If that's all, you know, if that's all you have, if you're an atheist, you were born to lesbians. Sure. He's going to use that. But when you know better, you do better. So when you're climbing the ladder and you get to a certain level, like there was a while before I finally was able to give up cannabis, but God had been telling me that I needed to give it up. And because I didn't, that legal right was part of what trapped me into them end up right. getting access to me down the road because God had told me, I didn't know where it was in the Bible yet, but it doesn't matter if you don't know where it is in the Bible, if you have a relationship with the Holy spirit, you know? And so, um, I just kind of ignored it and was like, I know I need more time. I'm going to, you know, and I did, I, w- I went back and forth on and off of it for a long time. And they, it's, it's, they say it's not addicting, but it is, it's spiritually addicting. It's not physically yeah. addicting. Right. It is spiritually addicting because yeah. you want to feel, um, especially somebody like me, who's always looking for a spiritual experience. You want to, I had beautiful relationship with Mary Jane, but she was a major idol in my life, yeah. you know, for years. Right. And, you know, it did, it, ru- it ruined my teeth. It ruined my gums. Um, not bad enough that it couldn't be recovered by diatomaceous earth. Thank God for putting me onto that. But I mean, it, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a stepping stone that can't, is a slippery slope that can do God willing what he wants you to, but then you get to a point And like, I, uh, that was a beautiful story. The one I just told him Then I have another guy who he'd been Christian long enough and knew better. And he went back and ate some mushrooms and he was completely tortured in the hand of God held in the hand of God while he was just wrapped with all these demons while they fought over his soul. And, and what he, what they said to him was the demons on the other side were, were saying, um, Jesus Christ was basically, you know, having this court battle for his soul in court. And they were like, well, uh, Jesus has said he's mine. And the demons are saying, well, then why does he keep eating from our table? Wow. You know, so, so you get to a level where you got to quit eating off of the enemy's table because that is the fruit of tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's the way I see it. Um, But Adam and Eve, what happened when they partook of the fruit of knowledge of good and evil? You know, they still had grace. He still was with them. He'll still be with you. Doesn't mean that he can't show up in that experience. But, um, you know, when you get to a certain point and when you have a certain level of knowledge, you know, I think we're expected to put it down and stay away. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. So was was your, I mean, I, your husband obviously grew up, your ex-husband obviously grew up then in a, you know, Satanist family then, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I assume because his mother's cold yeah. lady and yeah. um, she's very much helped him take my kids and supported him. I just, I just don't know. My thing was, I don't care how, like, I, I've never done anything evil you know I cheated on him that hurts but I was never a bad mom I never had done anything to the point that I should have deserved to lose access to my children you know and I I could not fathom as a mother helping keep children from another mother ever it just made me sick that she could do it and and just happily um and and how even that um, she lied to him for his whole life about who his father was supposedly. Then again, maybe she didn't. Maybe he knew his whole life. I mean, that was the way they set up the scene that supposedly she cried and cried when he went and confronted her after he got the DNA test back, you know. But um, I okay, so this is one thing that was interesting. When I literally after I wo- wrote sovereignty papers because I realized that, you know, what I had done with um, the maritime and the land Mm -hmm. jurisdiction, I just kind of started feeling like this probably isn't going to work. I don't know why, but then I, this girl that was leading me through it, who's kind of coaching me on all of this stuff um, had told me, well, I've also done sovereignty, you know, and just claim sovereignty. Well, I, I knew enough about, spirit that I didn't have to do anything physically. Like, so I just grabbed a piece of paper. 
well, not, I shouldn't say physically, but through the government. I knew I didn't have to do anything officially through the government because I just knew God, the government. So I picked up a piece of paper and I scribbled out just pages and pages of breaking, renouncing generational curses. Yeah. And I literally woke up the next morning and God like peeled the bell off my eyes. And all of a sudden, all the stuff my sister had been saying to me for months about all my brothers being Freemasons and understanding that she was being trained in witchcraft and doing sorcery on me and stuff. And this book that she had and like these texts from my mom and then just this weird, like, uh, Iron Man dial that my dad had had like surgically implanted into his chest. Um, all this weird stuff, just all of a sudden, like the, the magic that they had been doing to keep me blinded, it just faded off. And all of a sudden I was like, I am trapped inside of Sodom and Gomorrah in a house that my brothers rented out to me. And it, it just all started making sense and, and ping, 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 ping. My whole life just started pinging in my brain. And I just like hurried and went and started gathering a few things. I was like, I can't let anybody know. My sister had come back and started staying with me. Her handler had started showing up back at the house again, who um, I grew up with being close to his brother. And I already knew that they were Freemasons because I called his dad because her handler had broken her toe in the door uh -huh. when she was at his house one night. And she, so she came to live with me and they, they staged this whole thing. She did it on purpose. She called the police. She's like, watch, they're not going to do anything. I'm going to call the police. And she called him. She, she even got in a fight with cops. She's like, you freaking Freemason. You're not even going to do anything. Are you? You're going to not even go and arrest him. He broke my fucking toe. You know, she's like having this whole fight at five in the morning with this cop right in front of me. And this was all to try to make me know, like, you can't trust the cops. They're all Freemasons. They're not going to do anything for you. When I'd watched all this stuff play out with my sister for years, they took her kids away before they took my kids away. She didn't have custody of her kids. She had no money, you know, and I don't even know if she, I, I started thinking, I don't even know, maybe she actually does see her kids. I don't know how big a liars they are, you know, but she was living at my, in my RV on this property. And, um, I also started understanding that they can do scrying through the dogs. Cause every time I would, um, leave the house and come outside, she would send her dogs out. And you just know when somebody's watching you through animal eyes, I've talked to a few people about it. It's really weird, but like they would come and follow me all over the property and she used to do this thing where she would go like this, you know, and I felt her inside of my head one time when we were together, she was giving me a massage on my head and I felt her inside of my head. I I've had that a few times in my life, you know, when somebody's like astral traveling into your consciousness. And, and so just all of this stuff started adding up and I had to get out of there. Um, and one of the things that hit me was my daughter told me, oh, grandma walked me across the street one time and took me to that man's house across the street. And she goes, wait, mom. She goes, I can't even believe that she figured this out. She's my little prophetess. She just has abilities. And she was only like seven or eight at the time. But she, she goes, are the same Barlows that own this house, the same Barlows that live across the street from grandma and grandpa? And all of a sudden, a whole bunch of stuff came back to me. Like, these people were in my ward growing up when I was little. They lived right next door to another family, really thick in the cult in my in my family that I knew weird stuff was going on in their family. And um, I, I realized that these little girls that I used to play with when I was really little, that this house that we had gone to when I was so young, like, I don't even remember it. I just remember that it happened that... I went and slept over at their grandpa's house and he had this big weird house. And all these years I had never realized that that house is across the street from my husband's parents' house. Like that's, and, and it's on Elm street. <laughs> and I just, I knew that I had been drugged and something happened while I was asleep. That's all I know. I just, cause for years I had known that like they were giving us this red punch at peace parties and stuff and primary grown up. And I mean, down to one of the guys, he had us watch a movie in, in the bed in his room when we were like eight years old, wow. just weird stuff like that, you know? Yeah. And so it hits me that the guy, the guy who lives across the street from my parents, who wasn't that long ago that I had watched um, their dad who lived down the street. I think he was in the bishopric or something with my dad at some point. Um, his, he, one of them died, Duncan Barlow. 
I can't remember if he's one of the brothers that died, but I knew that my brothers were in business with them and that they owned this house that I was living in, but my brothers were managing it for them. And that house was weird. There was weird stuff going on at that house, like set up. It was clear they were like poisoning the water and there was some weird like little cage in the backyard that later hit me. It was like for a human in yeah. the ground. And, um, and it was, it was right over Hill Air Force Base, like literally Hill Air Force Base, which is a big programming place, looks right over the land. And it was right around the corner from the Riverdale police who are some of the most corrupt police ever. Um, but so his family lived right across the street from this other family that I realized was like in with my brothers and, and my brothers all don't do business with anybody that's not, you know, in the network. And I knew that because this other lady who is a therapist for SRA victims, supposedly, I think what she is, is a reprogrammer yeah. um, because everybody that's ever written a book on it, that's ever told a story coming out of the church. She knows them and is best friends with them. So she, she's the one who taught me most of this stuff. And she came to my house one night and my brother called her and asked her if he could come over and meet with her because um, there's these ladies in the church who, and this is where I, where I say, like, I don't know about, um, uh, not Spencer, but Tom Harrison is his real name. The therapist guy um, who wrote visions of glory. Mm -hmm. Like, cause he talks about how he, he's a therapist for kids who've been sexually abused. He talks about that in his book. And so he said like, God will give him revelations and show him people in the church who's going to help and stuff. So may maybe he's legitimately doing that. He's also said that all of the general authorities hate him. So may maybe he's one of the good guys, but then I've heard other people say they've seen him at some of these houses where rituals have been happening, but maybe he's there trying to get kids out. I don't know what he's doing, but I thought he was a good guy. So, so this woman um, knows and is connected to, well, my point about him is may, there, there are people that remain in the church, even though that they know the church is corrupt, just kind of quietly because right. they know what's going on and they're trying to help people. And so um, she had told me that there was this whole group of women who had been in the church for years who were just quietly there, who aren't real devoted members anymore, helping children. And a couple of them, their job for the church was that they were hand couriers. So the church still uses the old fashioned hand courier method. So they don't, you know, end up with somebody infiltrating their email and finding out what they're up to. So, but what these ladies were doing is they would get the, this job as a hand courier and they would um, go and open the letter, unseal the letter, make a copy of it, several copies of it, seal it back up and go deliver it for years. Wow. So they have two storage sheds and I pray all the time that these women will come out one day and open up these sheds. Um, really? Read my handbook first. <laughs> Go read my handbook. Set yourself free. Get under, you know, protection. And where can then people come find out. your handbook at? Um, they can email me. At, well, I'll give you my email to post. But it, it's attorney A T Yah Y A H for Yahweh. Attorney yeah, at Yah. I'll put it in the, in the description. Okay. okay. And so. Um, they have these two stored one, you know, one a backup and one a major one and been there. She had been to the storage shed and seen, and she's like, they have files and files, like alphabetical records of all these people who have these handwritten letters of setting up rituals and all kinds of stuff in the church, just as proof as years, 30 years worth of evidence. Damn, backed up in those storage sheds, Jeez. Right. So she'd been there. And told me about it. She's like, oh, I'd love to take you there sometime. She was always acting like she wanted me to be in. And she never, nothing ever came out, which is another reason I knew she was double, double agent. But um, so she was coming over to my house one night. And my brother, I had told him about this as well. Because the last year before I cut my whole family off, I was going to start my own podcast. And I was going to start talking about what I knew was going on in the Mormon church. I had no idea my family was involved in it, but I was hanging out with my brother every day who was listening to me talk about Freemasons and sodomites and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, he would say to me, he'd always go, gosh, dang, you're so good at figuring this stuff out. And he would look disappointed. He'd like look down and kind of shake his head. <laughs> and, and it's because 
I didn't even know at the time, like I was in the belly of the beast telling the beast, baby, I got your number for, you know, a while all over the place before I had any clue. And I just wish I could go back and like know every time that I was talking to somebody, ratting them out right to their own face while they're just sitting there like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow. So he, um, let's see, where was I going with my brother? Um, oh, so he asked to talk to her. He wanted to know. He, he was like, can, can I come over? I want to find out if anybody even knows, like she knows. Um, mm. So she came over and he, he came and he gave her a list of names of all these people that were doing business with my dad. And it was funny because she ended up, she wrote all, down all the names, went home and she's a flake and never falls through on anything. So of course no, nothing ever came of it except for that one night she Marco poloed me and pulled up the list of names and sent me a video. She's like, is this from you? Was this you that gave me these names? I can't remember. Hey, you like my glasses? <laughs> They're so ugly. I'm seriously so blind, but um, it's late. And I was going to sit down and write in my journal and I walked past this piece of paper and it was a piece of paper that I wrote down after talking to you and you gave me all these names of people, I think. I mean, Dick Miles, Kevin Garn, the SAO Group, Western States Lodging, John Q. Hammonds, Monson, Boswell, Victor Kimball, Kale Murdoch. Haven Barlow, Stuart Barlow, Jared Yates. Is that you? Because um, I'm walking past this piece of paper and I get this thought, read the paper, and I start reading and I realize I know every last name of every person on this paper. And before I got down to Haven, I was thinking of my, in thinking to myself, Haven Barlow, and I read Haven Barlow about shit myself. So if this was from you, talking to you, Oh my gosh, call me and um, let's talk. I'm going to look up a couple more of these people because I'm like dying right now. Maybe I'm just too tired, but holy crap. Anyway, I'm so sorry for what you're going through. You still look peaceful and beautiful. But yeah, I say you just put helping people on hold for now and like get the black and the darkness out of your own life like she'd forgotten the whole thing which is another shows me she's total did because she was very um she's a very trained programmed double agent there herself so she i have a video of all the names that she read she because i didn't write them down i didn't think anything at the time and um everybody that i knew that my dad had done business with one of them was uh Miles, what's his name? There's Barbara Miles and Dick Miles. And they are President Nelson's daughter and son-in-law. Oh, yeah. They've been. You know their story? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So they they were the ones who um, had the whole, like, 30 people come out reporting that they were having satanic sex pedophilia parties at their house for years. And he's on the list. So I knew about this guy. And then I go back and hear this video again, like a couple years later. And I'm like, wait a minute. And then I realized my other brother had told me, um, Oh, I don't know anything about that guy in pedophilia. All I know is that like dad tried to start a grocery store with him and they shared a locker at the temple. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, you you don't share a locker at the temple with Dick Miles for nothing, Jeez, you know. No kidding. That's the thing. Yeah. That's, so. Yeah, there's plenty of information out there that you know people can, no doubt, tie things together to realize that this stuff is real. You know, it's happening damn near in every community. You know, it's just. Well, and I went to my parents' house and confronted them at one point. Um, really. Before I before I really believed it I didn't really believe it I just wanted to know why my sister was so crazy because she'd been telling me all this stuff for months and months and months and um I just showed up at their apartment one day they'd moved in this little apartment and um my dad was just sitting on the couch and I went in and my sister had told me it was it was funny too because my sister set it up almost like she was praying that I would confront him at some point 
I know my sister's going to get out one day, but she's just a mess right now. She's into just deep witchcraft and totally being handled and stuff. But I had, I know she's going to come out of it one day. Um, but she, uh, how did she put it? She's the one who taught me a lot of the rules of, of Freemasonry and how they work. Like during the day, you, you won't ever know because, you know, you can be married to one, but they're not going to do anything. Um, at night or suspicious, they do all of their work during the day when it just seems like they're at work. Right. Really so, amazing. so, um, and then the other thing she told me is their wife is their main cover. And so yeah. as soon as you start trying to confront a man, his wife's going to defend him and she doesn't let him talk and she takes over and you're going to believe the woman because who's not going to believe, you know, the wife. So I went over to my dad's house and that's exactly what happened is I started asking my dad, okay, can you tell me why my sister keeps telling me that you and the brothers are all Freemasons? Like, what is this about? And he's like, I don't know anything about that. You know, my mom comes and sits down. Oh, well, you know, and starts doing this whole cover thing. And I'm like, I said, mom. And I told my mom what my sister had said. I said, why don't you just go in the other room? Cause honestly, you're just making it worse. And if anything, making him look guilty. So get out. This is an AB conversation. See your way out of it. And I sent her out and she walked in the bathroom and messed with her hair for like 30 seconds and came back in and sat right, right down, tried to be quiet for one minute, couldn't help it. And then she just started running her mouth again. And cause my mom is like me, she, she talks, but she, right. she has right. taken her oath well enough that what she revealed to me, my whole life is stuff on a government level about the Illuminati. Yeah. stuff on yeah. in Hollywood about the Illuminati. She never told me about it related to the church, but she wanted, she's, she, I am very much a product of my mother. And I came to these parents for a reason because they do have things that I needed to inherit in order to be able to do what I'm doing. Um, but like my dad, I asked him, I said, what, why, did, why did you, you shared a locker with Dick Miles? You know, he's a known pedophile, right? Like, 30 people accused him. I don't care if he was indicted or not. It, like at that point, you know, yeah. and um, yeah. he, he was like, well, we were just doing a business. You know, it, it, it was just yeah. so <laughs> dumb, the excuses they tried to give me. And then he just sat down and sunk down and just like looked like a little kid who was getting yelled at by his parents, you know? And he's like, I don't understand why you're doing this to me, you know? And, I said, I don't know. I grew up having to have bishops interviews with you and, you know, being chastised for this and that and the other. And I was always taught um, by my parents that you have to be really careful who your friends are. So maybe yeah. you could explain to me why that doesn't apply to you when it comes to business, you know, and just went on and on with them about that for a while. And my mom ended up bawling at the end and she followed me out to my car and she was just like, what do you want me to do? What do you, we, he, we need money. You know, it was more just like, this is an affiliation and we don't know right. anything. And, um, you know, he has to do business. And I said, I don't care. I said, I don't know what's going on with that guy or who he is, but I don't, I don't know him. And there's something wrong with him, something majorly wrong with him. It, and that was just when the discernment started. And that was still months before everything really kind of got peeled back. But, um, mm -hmm. I mean, since then, the thing that's great is when you go and break all your cur curses and, go through the renunciations, God will real Holy spirit, the relationship with Holy spirit that you thought you might've had in Mormonism, which was actually the Kundalini, which God is always still going to try to get in when he can. But if you have a covenant with Kundalini spirit, false Holy spirit through a loose faring covenant, you're only going to get so much. But when you do the renunciations and undo all that, then God really starts talking to you. And he's, I mean, he didn't stop after that. He just, he's unveiled everybody to me. I know everybody in my family's whole neighborhood growing up who was part of their cult. He's taken me into their houses and shown me which people are how wicked and who, you know, he just, he just wanted me to know. And then he'll show me who to do um, intercessory prayer for. And then he'll tell me who not to like that. That person's not even going to repent. So don't even, Wow. It says in the Bible, like, like do there's certain parts in the Bible that say, do not pray for this people. And so there are certain ones mm -hmm. like that's one thing that Jesse and the other lady who interviewed me, I can't even remember her name right now, but um, they, they're always talking about how we have to forgive these pedophiles, yeah. you know, 
And it's like, at a certain level, you're, you're just, you're not going to repent. You're just sailed way too far down the river and God knows who those people are. And there are Bible verses that talk about the wickedness of at a certain level. He says, do not pray for this people because I will not hear their cries. And he shows me who they are and will, you know, tell me not to pray for them. And so, so the one thing that I really want to e express to people as much as I, um, when I was Mormon, I never could be a missionary. I never, I never knew how to share the gospel. And it made me sad, but I was like, that's not my calling. I'm a healer. You know, um, I've never felt so inspired to be a missionary in my life to help people out of the church and to help people out in such a way that they don't throw away Jesus with the bathwater right. because you don't have to do that. Like people get so freaked out about oh, if Mormonism is not true, then like I did, like then right. everything's a lie. Then like the end of the world, you know, and it's like, yeah. no, because the interesting thing is that I've started to even understand the more I get in the Bible and the more I go and listen to other pastors from other religions and stuff like, and what they're teaching in other paths of Christianity is that the interesting thing about Mormonism and why it's such a great deceit is because it does have, and it's one of the reasons they're so able to sell. It's the only true church because it really does have like of any other church on the earth, the most perfect counterfeit pattern Right. of laying on of hands the melchizedek priesthood is actually a thing they, you don't find the melchizedek priesthood in other religions you right. don't very right. often find the laying on of hands or baptism being done the right way or um you know apostles like it's it's fascinating how good they did that but the thing is is you just have to understand that that's a counterfeit pattern and wait for jesus to come right. and restore the church and step yeah. out and do the renunciations and hold on to the bible just Put away the Book of Mormon and hold yeah. on to the Bible, you know. Yeah. And yeah, it's, well, this is this has been great, Teresa. I, Teresa, I really appreciate your time, and uh, you know, hopefully, this is a uh, help open people's eyes a little bit and help them understand that you know, I've only been awake to this kind of stuff probably for about a year, and it just amazes me how more people continue to come out or to reach out and so it's obvious yeah. that uh it's going to continue that way and hopefully you know like you when you talked about the mission thing yeah i want a mission you know didn't want to but i did luckily not luckily because it was brutal but i came home because of crohn's disease three and a half months in but like you say i'm more 100 times more passionate about sharing truth about these things than i ever was anytime in 45 years in the church, yeah. you know? So anyway, so yeah, you're doing great work and uh, you know, let's keep in touch and do this again down the road. Absolutely. So thanks. Sounds thanks good. so much for your time. And uh, you know, like I say, we'll be in touch and I'll, I'll uh, put your email as well as um, what other things can, uh, do you want me to list that people can connect with you, your Instagram or. Yeah, I have um, my Instagram is attorney at yaw. Um, my email attorney at yaw at gmail, and then I my YouTube channel is called Kadosh Life, which we'll put oh, this God. up on my YouTube as well, um, oh. so that my crowd can find it. And um, that's that's all I have. I'm pretty Perfect. keep it. Oh, oh, I well, actually, I, I have all the same stuff that I have on YouTube on Rumble. So if you don't like YouTube, yeah, you can go to Rumble Perfect. and all my same stuff as well under Kadosh Life. I'll make sure I'll link her in the description. So, okay. Well, thanks so much and uh, have a great day. Okay, hey, thanks, Steve. You bet. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.